recap just about another minute, let a couple more people hop on. Not a beer. <laughs> it's a seltzer. All right, I will go ahead and get started as a couple more people hop on. Just wanted to say hello and welcome everyone to the Optimize Your Health series, Nutrition for a Healthy Lifestyle and Longevity, presented by Dr. Eric Secor of Hartford Healthcare. Please remember to keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the chat and I will read them to Dr. Secor when he takes questions at the end. We will do our best to answer everyone's questions. However, any questions that don't get answered live can be sent to Dr. Secor to follow up on after the presentation. If you have any questions about the Virtual Fitness Center or our services, please email us at fitness.center at rtx.com. Thank you guys so much for joining us today and I will pass it over to Dr. Secor. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate the invitation and um, the opportunity for me to share something that I am very passionate about, which is of course, uh, wellness, uh, integrated medicine, Mediterranean diet, um, et cetera. Um, so we're going to talk about um, a portion of our Optimizing Your Health series, um, an area that I really, really like talking about, which is nutrition for longevity and lifestyle. Um, as always, I've probably put too much into this lecture, but um, we're going to try to make it through these four key components. You guys will all get copies of this presentation, and um, as as was discussed, I'm available to answer um, questions or talk to you afterwards um, in the coming days and week. You know, my goals are, you know, very specific. I, I do want to make the case for um, migrating you towards a Mediterranean diet. This is the core nutritional approach I really focus on with most of my patients, realizing that there's nuances in between um, that we have to um, dissect for people, but I really want to make the case for that. I'm going to talk to you about a couple of research, you know, research uh, studies, just demonstrating uh, that we might want to pay attention to this. I'm going to break out some of those individual components of the Mediterranean diet and talk to you about um, why should you care about these individualized components that make up the benefits of the Mediterranean diet. Um, I'm really interested in the blue zone. And so I'm going to talk to you briefly about the blue zones a few more slides, and then then I have another section on really, um, you know, what what is the the meat of um, how we all transition. Um, when I talk to you, I'm also talking um, about myself and trying to educate myself because we're all trying to migrate into a a healthier lifestyle. We're all trying to motivate ourselves, friends, families. So I have this that section on uh, you know. Um, you know, what are your motivations uh, and some practical examples on really how we how we can move through this. Um, I'll move pretty quickly through through these slides. Um, since you have them, I'll try to pause on some of the areas where I think it's really important to consider. And, and obviously, uh, in the question period, we'll try to leave 10, 15 minutes to really reflect and discuss these things. And so let's go into to, to for part one and making the case for adopting or migrating towards this Mediterranean diet. And, and, you know, I want to motivate people and I really want to be sure that people understand, you know, what is real food. And I don't want you to be confused about what you're eating, what you're being advertised to and, and what is out there for us. Um, so I hope you can appreciate, and some of these slides may be duplicative of my last brief presentation, but on the left, hopefully you appreciate that, you know, this is stuff we eat. It's not real food. I do not consider this stuff real food. And so, um, you know, stuff that has a shelf life of several years, months, decades, et cetera, I don't consider this part of your real day-to-day, -day, um, everyday dietary experience. On the left, I hope you appreciate that these are things you should look at and say, wow, that really looks like good food. And so my whole job and my whole motivation is to migrate people from that left side uh, towards the right side. Um, and I don't want you to be confused. Um, I want you to have clarity about what you're doing. 
Um, a lot of people come in and see me and there's this confusion, which I think um, is misplaced that they think they're eating uh, real food. And so, you know, I have my biases, uh, which you guys will know about very well after this lecture. Um, I don't think of this as real food. Um, Wendy's Frosty, I was, I think I was in Sam's Club a couple of weeks ago, um, and I walked around the corner, and there was a big display about the brand new Kellogg cereal Wendy's Frosties. I think this is absurd, uh, you know, and I don't think this is something that should be part of you, your family, or your kids' healthy breakfast. Uh, so whether it's Reese's Puffs or Fruit Loops or Frosted Flake Bars, our Peep cereal, limited edition, or Twinkies hosted cereal, um, I want you to be very clear that I don't consider this real food. And so, you know, when we think about our themes, right, we want to migrate from this sad standard American diet towards our Mediterranean diet. Um, and, you know, whether there's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, again, um, I want us all to understand that the day-to-day -day incremental decisions that we make will add up to eventually uh, form and craft our health over time. Um, I don't have to tell you about the young kids under 10 that have diabetes and high cholesterol. And, you know, we seem to be confused about this. I am not confused about this at all. So if your diet is, is um, more on the left side, and if it is not on the right side, then these are the strides we want to make. And we want to make small choices every day. And we want to migrate away from that sad diet towards that Mediterranean diet. I'm going to get into some of the, the, the nuts and bolts of a couple of, uh, of papers that I've highlighted. Um, this is a paper on um, a cancer and Mediterranean diet, uh, a, a critical review of the nutrient components, particularly in cancer. And it basically says the Mediterranean diet is considered one of the, one of the most worldwide healthy dietary patterns, thanks to the combination of foods and food components such as its antioxidant and anti-inflammatory nutrients. Uh, one of their tables highlights some of these roles, particularly in cancer. Obviously, fruits and vegetables, their components, micronutrients, carotenoids, selected vitamins, new, uh, micronutrients, fiber, um, polyphenols, et cetera. These, many of these have anti-tumor effects. And now we've documented that when we, when we have a diet that is largely composed of these, we have less risk of epithelial cancer, digestive cancer, breast cancer, genital urinary tract cancer. Uh, fish is another component. This is where we get our essential fatty acids, our omega-3s, if you will, particularly DHA and some of the EPA that we'll touch on later. And we know that these are anti-inflammatory. They affect cell growth of tumor cells. They affect all the signaling that happens inside the cell that makes um, cancer cells more aggressive and more metastatic. And so when we consume these, uh, we do have less levels of liver cancer and colon cancer. Um, I've highlighted the red box there that um, even when we have healthy food, we have to be very cautious about the way we cook it. And we have to be thoughtful about particularly burning and high heat. Prolonged high heat in burning uh, generates potentially uh, carcinogenic compounds, which increase the risk of stomach and colon cancer and selected demographics. So these are the, um, the heterocyclic amines, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So when we really burn or when we grill or when we use high heat, that's when we take these chemical components and we turn them into potentially carcinogenic compounds. Um, many of these uh, components are found in our processed meats. So it's even worse when we take our processed meats uh, that have a lot of these compounds and then we make them super well done or we burn them. Um, when we talk about smoking and grilling, if we are smoking or we're using low heat for a long time, it doesn't seem to produce the same chemicals as blackened or burned or high heat um, compounds. Um, another typical component, whoops, uh, is olive oil. Olive oil, which, which is one of the hallmarks of the Mediterranean diet. 
um, is rich in polyphenols. Um, and these have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and anti-mutagenic effects and chemoprotective effects. And so um, this paper suggests that um, there are very key components of the Mediterranean diet that help reduce and prevent uh, many of the lifestyle um, um, cancers that we can get from a maladaptive lifestyle. And if we start migrating and adding these components, our risks will go down. Obviously, don't burn your meat. Um, second paper, um, this is 12 weeks, um, looking at 12 weeks of the Mediterranean diet and asking the question, can we improve cognition um, in elderly people? So we hopefully are all aging um, and we're all gonna be elderly at some point. And so the goal of this paper was to basically say that our dietary fats may reduce dementia. They really wanted to look at a particular uh, effect on cognition by adding uh, fish or non-fish foods for a limited time, just 12 weeks. And so what they did was they took folks and they added the Mediterranean and DASH. Uh, DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. Um, I think in my previous lecture, I gave a picture of the Mediterranean diet and those individuals that may be salt sensitive or have high blood pressure, we do the Mediterranean plus DASH. So therefore we increase some of the potassium and magnesium foods and we limit high sodium, high saturated fat, and of course, added sugars. For one of the outcomes, they used a screening, a cognitive abilities screening instrument, the CASI, before and after the therapy. And the results, uh, participants in the in intervention group had significant higher post-intervention cognitive ability score. And so um, they're suggesting that, um, and also they saw increased blood levels of omega-3 fatty acids. And so the take home is even in 12 weeks of migrating again away from that SAD diet into a Mediterranean diet, even focusing on high essential fatty acid fish, you can see real changes in cognition in as little as 12 weeks. I think that's pretty important. Um, this is a paper that actually surprised me. Uh, this is a 20, 2022 paper just a couple of months ago. And they were evaluating the Mediterranean diet as a shield against male infertility and cancer risk, predominantly by environmental pollutants. Um, my second doctorate, I have a PhD in occupational environmental health from UConn. So um, a lot of my focus was on the environment, uh, environmental pollutants. My area of concern was immune modulation. And um, I looked at some foods, but I also looked at some dietary um, additives in the form of uh, spices and botanicals. So this is something I'm very interested in. And in certain areas where there's more pollutants, there's also a higher risk of male fertility and male cancer. And so basically um, environmental factors um, and their effects on health are well-documented. You know, heavy metals, uh, uh, polycyclic hydrocarbons, uh, bisphenols, dioxins, pesticides, ultrafine particles, um, we've done a better and better job in this country, particularly after the 70s, when we did the clean water and clean air, the EPA, you know, we've done better and better, although some of those policies are continually uh, being challenged uh, to the degree at which they should be enforced. But at any rate, um, we have exposures. Uh, many of these exposures uh, interact with reproduction and also um, increase cancer. And so basically their goal was to see um, can these dietary components uh, reduce uh, effects of cancer and also um, fertility in people who have uh, who live and work in highly polluted areas? And so basically they looked at the components of the Mediterranean diet, particularly fruits, vegetables, their flavonoids, their soluble, insoluble fiber, and basically they are hypothesizing and determining that as we increase these antioxidant and high fiber foods, they can aid in eliminating all of these uh, pollutants that we are exposed to. And because they are antioxidant, they can also mitigate or lessen their effects through a variety of mechanisms that they want to go into. Um, so they conclude that in areas where people um, may have a poor diet, may have high environmental exposure, um, this may be counteracted by a rich um, 
flavonoid or antioxidant rich Mediterranean diet. And we'll break down these components in a future, uh, couple of future slides. Uh, there was another paper I thought was interesting again, 2022 um, in January, uh, looking at schizophrenia subtypes and their association with low adherence to the Mediterranean diet. And so um, I do not see a lot of schizophrenia uh, patients. Um, we are looking at developing some clinics in a, a association with our Rushford Addiction Center, which I'm very excited about. But basically, um, I think this is this has the potential to make sense for the general population also. So basically, we have a patient population that that may have mental health issues, schizophrenia, and, and they are known to have poor dietary habits. And so what happens is these folks have poor diets, um, and they are at increased risk for a variety of comorbidities like diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease. And so what we know is that um, when these folks um, have um, spikes in their mental health issues, their lifestyle and quality of life goes down substantially. So long story short, um, these folks, their goal was to see um, what can we do with the Mediterranean diet and, and what are the barriers and opportunities in this population. And so they want to investigate the dietary habits and adherence to the Mediterranean diet in subjects with schizophrenia versus healthy controls, a little case control study. And so basically they said adherence to the Mediterranean diet was decreased in subjects with um, this type of schizophrenia called deficit schizophrenia. And, and I thought this was very interesting because these folks have lower emotional range. They have a diminished sense of purpose. They have diminished social drive. And when it was um, determined that they had poor adherence to this, they also had greater risk of obesity, overweight, anxiety, depression, and apathy. And so even though we have a population that has schizophrenia, um, I know we all go through times when we feel a little apathetic. Uh, we have a, a periodic diminished sense of purpose. So, um, you know, my take home is that I think um, this is important for our uh, population that has mental health issues, which is growing as we know, but also I, I think for all of us who are, um, who don't have significant mental health issues, but who have periodic anxiety, depression, apathy, et cetera, which we all sometimes experience, I think adherence to this type of diet may prove um, that it can add resilience to us and hopefully um, keep us with in proper weight and keep us um, you know, out of those dips, um, valleys, and spikes of anxiety, depression, and apathy. Uh, this next paper looks at the association of sticking to a DASH, we talked about that, versus the Mediterranean diet, with, with mortality in subjects with glucose problems. So um, hyperglycemia, uh, prediabetes, those of us who are, who are maturing into our 40s and upper 50s and 60s, we know about our A1C and we know about hyperglycemia, et cetera. So basically um, the background suggests that there are beneficial effects to the Mediterranean diet, uh, not only in preventing uh, cancers, but also they were looking at olive oil as a particular component in that it can not only decrease cancer risk, but also decrease risk of sugar-related mortality. And so they wanted to look at the association between olive oil consumption cancer risk, and also um, sugar metabolism. Uh, the N equals the participant number. So they looked at a variety of studies with over 1 million people, which I think is pretty high. And when they, when they looked at the 45 studies with the highest olive oil consumption, they saw about a 31%, one third risk uh, of reduction in any type of cancer. And so what they were trying to look at in this type of analysis was the potential impact of that one component of the Mediterranean diet, which is olive oil. And their suggestion is not only can it exert a beneficial effect in cancer prevention, it also can help with glucose regulation, which we'll talk about in, in more detail in a few minutes. Um, Let's just talk, I think this might be one of the last uh, papers, um, but this one is 2018 uh, Journal of Circulation. It's looking at what is the impact of a healthy lifestyle on your overall life expectancy? 
um, the Mediterranean-like diet was a component of this paper. So basically the background, did you know, Americans have a shorter life expectancy compared to almost all other high income or developed nations. So they wanted to estimate the impact of healthy lifestyle factors on premature mortality and life expectancy and life extension. So they looked at through all their analysis, um, they identified five very important low risk lifestyle factors, not smoking, low body mass index, 30 plus exercise, minutes of exercise a day and the moderate to vigorous amount. Moderate alcohol intake, which usually corresponds to red wine, one to two, five days a week. And then five, high diet quality score, which basically is the Mediterranean-like diet. I thought the results were pretty, pretty, um, pretty impactful to me. And so they looked at people's lives for 34 years and they were trying to understand what happened to those that adhere to these five versus those that do not. And basically they said, once you turn 50, does your life expectancy change going forward for those that adhere versus those that don't? So those that adhered, um, we saw 14 years longer life for females and 12 years of longer life for males. So again, um, you know, these are five core activities. Um, this is nothing overly complex, but this is really truly the impact of lifestyle on not only your health, your quality of life, but the degree that you will live, which I think is, uh, is very important. So hopefully I tried to introduce a couple of key papers, uh, a variety of studies, randomized control trials, case control trials, some epidemiological data that suggest um, there may be some benefits to adopting and migrating towards this Mediterranean diet. In the next few slides, I'm gonna focus on the individual components that were mentioned um, in the papers up above and see if we can dissect out those individual components and briefly highlight um, the importance of those components. So um, I really like this overall paper from an Italian um, uh, study. I think it was an Italian and French, but um, uh, 2019. Um, they're trying to look at the mechanism of the dietary components and then their beneficial uh, physiological effects. So hopefully by now you're thinking olive oil, fruits, vegetables, grains, fish, legumes, nuts, and seeds. These are really the key components of the Mediterranean diet. And we have polyphenols. Uh, many of these are the components uh, that give plants their color, which we'll talk about. Uh, fiber, um, obviously that's self-explanatory, but I'm gonna drill down on that. Um, phytosterols are also the components of, of plants that have uh, many different components um, suggesting like uh, soluble fiber. So it has a lot to do with intestinal absorption um, of certain nutrients and then degradation and lack of absorption of cholesterol. And of course, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, and this is your, um, your omega-3s, uh, your DHA, your EPA. So, you know, this gives you your justification of the components, the key four um, sub ingredients, if you will. And then what is their action? They are antioxidant. They help with anti insulin resistance, cholesterol absorption. They help with intestinal absorption and they um, increase our anti-inflammatory essential fatty acids. So when we look at these actions, much of this uh, is the desired effect of anti-aging cognition, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer, anti-diabetes, low cholesterol, low heart disease. Um, that's the stuff that we want in our life as we age. Uh, I hope the top isn't cut off, but it might be. Um, basically, this says polyphenol. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some of those first couple of categories and expand those. And so on your left, um, those of you who are excited about molecular structures, those are the types of polyphenols. We have flavanols and flavols and we have um, flavanones and et cetera. And so when we think about polyphenols, I like you to think about um, you know, colors and varieties of food. And so up top, we have um, some of the components of the brassica family, 
our leafy greens, broccoli, um, cauliflower, et cetera. So um, one of the key components uh, of, um, of the Mediterranean diet is these brassicas, uh, and they contain these polyphenols, as well as onions, ginger, broccoli. Everybody knows that red wine and dark chocolate, uh, good quality dark chocolate, usually oh, above 72, 80%. Um, that's where the low sugar, the low milk, but the high uh, flavanols are. Uh, we also see this in red wine, and we also see this in our black and green teas. I do like to migrate from the, to, from the black to the green and the white because they have a higher antioxidant component. Um, our spices, a huge component of the Mediterranean diet is the use of spice. We get into spice ruts in the United States, and we all use salt and pepper, but do we really use um, a lot of uh, fresh spices? Uh, I have a French and Italian side, and so there's always oregano, and generally there's parsley. Um, there might be some thyme, there might be some other things, but there are so many spices um, that we can use, and they all contain antioxidant uh, flavones. Um, the coloring of our citrus fruits and juices also contain um, flavonoids. Uh, many of these are in the skins. So when we shave these or we use the pulp, we're also getting an increase um, in these flavonoids. Um, one of the most important is our anthocyanidins. Um, these are our dark red, purple, black uh, vegetables. So when I talk to people about healthy smoothies and caloric stabilization and weight, I always want one to two cups of blueberry, blackberry, raspberry, dark cherry, because they are high antioxidant um, and they also help stabilize your blood sugar. And then um, isoflavones, um, a lot of soy. And so whether it's uh, soy milk or edamame um, or tofu or tempeh, um, soy has a variety of isoflavones that are um, very protective. Uh, last couple of years, I published a few papers with a group at Yale on isoflavones. And I think we demonstrated that they're antioxidant, they help the gut, they also decrease uh, inflammatory markers, and they help with cholesterol. So soy isoflavones are very important for those folks that may have breast cancer, even hormone um, positive. If you look at the Mayo Clinic guidelines, um, mild to moderate food-based soy um, is still okay a couple times a week, but we want to avoid any of the, the soy extracts. So we don't want to take anything with isolated extracts of soy, but generally food a couple times a week is okay. Uh, there's a reiteration on the right of just lists and some of these major sources of polyphenols. You can look through those as just a written example. Um, again, with the spices and seasoning, you got cacao, you have capers, saffron, oregano, rosemary, uh, soy is, is your fermented soy sauce. Um, we have, a, a, you know, curry and basils and thyme, ginger, cumin, which is the main component of curry is important. So there's a variety of things that we can use um, that are very, very beneficial. Um, again, an, a reiteration, quickly looking for ways to increase your flavonoid intake. Obviously, you have the rainbow there. There's a reason we always talk eat the rainbow. We're not talking about Skittles. We're talking about food. Uh, tea, again, uh, green tea. We can do a whole session on tea. Um, I'm on a couple of different boards nationally, and during COVID, they did a, uh, for a, for a, um, uh, a brainstorming session, we actually did a, a tea tasting, which was great. Uh, they sent us four teas to our house with four different mini honeys, and we had somebody walk us through the different types of tea, the antioxidant value, the different types of honey. It was a really, really fun way to explore tea and remind ourselves that there is smoky tea, black tea, oolong, half brown, half green, green and white. As you move from black to white, you move from fully oxidized to antioxidant. So um, you can add uh, flavonoids to your life by um, a couple of cups of green or white tea. Uh, fruits and veggies and moderate amounts of soy. Again, another way uh, to reiterate what we were just talking about. Fiber, uh, fiber, fiber, fiber. Um, some people are very confused again about fiber. And again, if you're eating the foods that we saw up above that are highly processed, 
Uh, the reason why we have such a digestive issue in this country, or one of the many reasons, is, um, is because of our uh, resistance to adopt a plant-based Mediterranean diet and have a diversity of soluble and insoluble fibers. Uh, statistics, you know, U.S. population, 290, I think, when this paper was done, 25% uh, have digestive complaints, one of four. It's a massive industry. Uh, we have foodborne illnesses regularly. We have irritable bowel, ulcerative colitis, diverticulitis. Um, most of these are not genetic. These are lifestyle. 20% uh, have gastroesophageal reflux disease because uh, we think we can eat anything we want whenever we want, and that's just not the case. Again, don't be confused. You can't eat whatever you want whenever you want, particularly as you mature because your system changes. Um, also, 75% of people over than 45, yay, um, have hemorrhoids. And usually this is an issue because of chronic constipation and lack of proper fiber, hydration, exercise. I know this is very uplifting, <laughs> but let's talk about uh, what we can do to support you. Um, again, you know, fiber, think in terms of two buckets, soluble, insoluble. You know, um, you know, soluble fiber attracts water and it becomes like a gel. Think of oatmeal. When you put oatmeal in the bowl, it gets mucilaginous and it gets smushy and it really absorbs water. These are things like okra and barley, nuts and seeds and beans and lentils, et cetera. Insoluble fiber, it does not absorb water and it does not become mushy. Put a piece of celery in water. Celery has insoluble fiber. Inside the cells, it has some soluble fiber and nutrients, but um, you know, many of our fruits and vegetables have a combination of both insoluble and soluble. That's why an apple, um, which I was eating earlier, um, is much better than apple juice, right? Apple juice, no fiber. Apple, we have both insoluble with the peel and we have both soluble. Um, and so that takes care of um, a lot of the components. Um, most Americans are low. The average adult eats less than 15 grams a day. We need well into the 25, 30, 40 grams a day, uh, according to the Institute of Medicine. So just hydrating properly, watching our things that dehydrate us, and thinking about combinations of soluble and insoluble fiber on a given week would, will totally improve our GI health um, in this country. We are generally not deficient um, in Nexium or the purple pill, uh, but generally we're deficient in these key dietary components. Um, you know, there's a huge, huge, huge interest in the microbiome, healthy gut bacteria. What do you think the best way to have a healthy gut bacteria is? It is to have a diverse plant-based uh, soluble and insoluble sources. So again, we are layering information. The core is the Mediterranean diet. Every single one of these components we're talking about is a component of a Mediterranean-like diet and we're demonstrating all the other effects of its components. And so broccoli, bananas, and beans, and artichokes, and blueberries, uh, et cetera, all um, have a variety of fiber sources that allow our healthy gut bacteria to be fed properly and grow and develop. Uh, one comment, uh, somebody made a comment, I think, in the last lecture about probiotics. I am generally a probiotic fan. However, I just want you to realize we don't understand uh, the proper probiotics for the proper person. We have billions of organisms in our body. We have many, many different strains. The best way long-term to guarantee a wide diverse microbiome, we can do a whole lecture on microbiome, is through food. Yes, you can take a, a probiotic. Yes, it will help you. But in general, your diversity will tend to shrink towards that probiotic. So I suggest if you are using a probiotic and that benefits you, rotate. Don't take one for five or 10 years. Uh, you know, take one for a couple months and then rotate. Um, use healthy yogurts that are already have natural probiotics within them. More fiber. Again, I, I think you guys get it. Um, you have soluble and insoluble. Um, hopefully you recognize uh, raspberries and chia seeds and flax seeds and avocado. Um, and, and some broccoli and brassicas and lentils. I think that's steel cut oatmeal um, and obviously cabbages and Brussels sprouts. And we talked about apple. Um, these are the things that will um, feed your microbiome 
They will bulk your stool. They will eliminate uh, toxins through the liver metabolism. They will lower cholesterol. Um, so this is the bucket that you want to be in. Again, not to reiterate this, but uh, you can tell I'm a fiber fan. So berries and nuts and lentils and broccoli and et cetera. Obviously, those of you who have diverticulitis or di diverticulosis lotus, lotus, and you have issues with the colon, yes, you have to watch food with seeds and popcorn. And so, you know, you're adjusting these suggestions according to your underlying health issues, realizing that the lack of many of these components do tend to contribute to those health issues to begin with. Another big component of uh, the Mediterranean diet is these essential fats. Uh, up in the header, if you can see that, I have a, I have a bar there. It basically says um, that we want uh, essential fatty acids. These, these are ones that you don't make, you have to ingest. Uh, we think of these as the omega-3s and the polyunsaturated. So I, I like visuals. Um, in general, you want to think that your, you know, if it's solid at room temperature, that's not the best. Those are your saturated. If it's liquid at room temperature, those are generally your unsaturated. Um, that's the structure that has the bonds with the hydrogen. So as you, as you remove some of those double bonds, they become more flexible and less stiff and they are liquids at room temperature. And so the whole goal here um, is to really migrate away from trans fats, away from saturated fats, into your polyunsaturated or monounsaturated. Again, we, we already know that olives and olive oil and nut butters and nuts and avocado are the cornerstone of the Mediterranean diet. And we already know that the highly processed uh, foods are, are not good for us. So over time, we wanna trans, trans, uh, you know, transfer and translate and, and migrate from those up, up the chain. You know, air fryers, you know, again, we don't have to take our French fries and drain them in fats. We now can take our potatoes, cut them ourselves, put them in our air fryer with a little bit of sprayed uh, olive oil like I do. And guess what? They become just as crisp, crispy and nice um, um, as compared to some of the things you can get at the fast food joints, except they don't have wheat and additives and sprays and some of these um, saturated fats. So again, I think you guys get this. Um, you know the trends are uh, away from trans, uh, away from saturated, minimizing those and into those polyunsaturated. Um, you know, I think in the future, we're going to, as part of our series, we're going to talk about labs and some of the things I do with my folks in the prevention and optimization area. But I run omega checks all the time through Quest Lab. This measures your um, omega-3s, your uh, DHA, D DPA, and it looks at your inflammatory fat. So, you know, it's a very simple blood test that I run. And basically, um, it'll give us some baseline on where are your essential fats, if you have no idea. Also, if you're at risk of uh, a family history of coronary artery disease, high cholesterol, you also should, if you're in your 40s or above with a family history, uh, also talk to your doc about a coronary calcium score. This will let you know about the deposition of placking in the coronary arteries, right? That's what all this leads to. This leads to high cholesterol, placking in your arteries, peripheral artery disease, and what? It supports the number one killer, which is still cardiovascular disease in our country. Um, again, other ways to show you um, uh, on the right, top high omega-3s, these are all omegas. On the left, one of the components of the Omega Check Lab is the DHA, docosahexaenoic acid, your 20 carbon chain um, essential fatty acid. And again, I give you some examples of those. Um, when I'm dealing with people that have deficiencies, which is 60% of my patient population, I'm encouraging both. I'm encouraging plant-based, I'm encouraging fish-based. If someone philosophically is not doing fish, uh, it is hard to get these levels up, I will tell you, but I do try to migrate to those plant-based sources and I tr do try to have people rotate those um, and get into the seaweeds and some of the algae oils, which are the few sources of DHA rich uh, vegan or vegetarian sources. But I hope uh, between those four slides, you get a feel for how you can um, increase those in a healthy way in your diet. 
All right, we're going to switch gears um, into the blue zones, and I think we have about uh, 10 or so minutes. I'm going to try to cut at 10 of for questions. Um, I'll, I'll go through this pretty quick, um, but basically the blue zones are the area of the world where people live over 100 very well. We have Loma Linda, California, the Seven Day of Venice. We have Costa Rica. We have Sardinia, Italy. We have Ikaria, Greece, and we have Okinawa, Japan. Um, and so basically, when you look at the history, um, uh, there was a researcher who was interested in looking at longevity. He, he paired with the National Geographic and they said, hey, let's look at the areas of the world. Are there areas where people age well? And they identified these five or so pockets of the world where people lived over 100 or better. But the key was they retained mobility, cognition, and they were free of significant, uh, low or free of significant illness. And this is basically how the blue zones um, were born. These are folks that lasted over 100. And they're, um, these are rates that are 10 times greater than the United States on average. Um, why are they blue zones? Because when they looked at the map, they circled them with blue marker, and that's why they became the blue zones. Um, anywho, let's... Uh, the, the, other, the other key thing that's important was part one was to identify the zones. Then part two, they wanted to say, what are the key characteristics of their lifestyle? So once they identified the zones, teams went in and they said, let's look at their characteristics and do these zones in different parts of the world have overlapping lifestyle characteristics that add to their longevity. And so they identified these nine characteristics and they are called the power nine, very, very snazzy. And we're going to zip through these power nine. We're going to power through these power nine. Uh, overview, um, move naturally, live with purpose, downshift your life, 80% rule, plant slants, wine at five, uh, right tribe, loved ones first, belong. So we have a combination of what you do with your life, how you move, what you eat, what you take in, and then philosophically, how are you living? Are you living with purpose? Are you managing your stress? And that's what they call these power nine. We're going to break these down. Uh, these are the characteristics, and then I'm going to go into a quick detail of each of these. And so, well, they did some partnerships, and basically they have these... Um, pilots all over the country. And basically, um, you know, after one year, they say, if you adopt these power nine, oh, you can add three years to your life. Um, healthcare worker claims can go down 50%. Um, if I was a large corporation and I saw this type of data, I would be encouraging all my employees to look at the healthy lifestyle, look at the Mediterranean diet. And, and again, just ask these questions about you, yourself, your family, and just try to say, where am I now, current state? Where am I, future state? And can I explore these nine attributes? And if I do um, and improve them or work on them, guess what? You're going to save money, save time, and live longer, which um, is great. Other projects, reduced obesity by 25%, tobacco use, 36%, eliminated disease risk factors, 50%, reduced uh, healthcare claims, um, Etc. Um, so let's uh, break down the individuals. Move naturally. Um, so basically, you know, many of these areas don't have gyms. They don't have things like I do, the Peloton in the basement. They're moving. They're moving in their environment. They're walking. They're gardening. They're walking to the grocery store. Um, mechanism, mechanization of our lives is wonderful, but we've transferred our physical work which is important for maintaining muscle mass, bone mass, uh, lean, lean, becoming lean, we've transferred much of that work, if you will, to mechanization. And so, uh, and of course, parts of the country um, are very good with mass transit, parts are very bad. I live in the Farmington Valley, I grew up here. There's not, it's not a walkable area. It's very difficult for us to walk uh, anywhere. I go to Italy, I walk an average of six to 10 miles a day, just in the village or just walking around. So again, they move, they move naturally and they move consistently. Purpose, um, you know, 
you guys all work at highly in a highly technical field and you know hopefully you are there and you are there contributing to the purpose of your life work and using your skill sets um, and that can be part of your purpose uh, but as we age and retire and i see lots of folks in their 50s and 60s and transitions and we talk about this what is your purpose and it doesn't have to be anything awe-inspiring it can be uh, being a good human, having a good family, having good, um, you know, collaborative conversations, adding back to my community, et cetera. So we want to explore our purpose. Uh, downshift, uh, this is this concept uh, that we experienced with COVID. We have increased stress. We've shifted our, our work lives, our home lives. And the idea that um, we know that stress uh, and the lack of resiliency adds to chronic inflammation, adds to chronic health disease, uh, insomnia, digestive complaints. We talked about that in lecture one. And so we need to, um, to mentally and emotionally allow ourselves time and space to downshift and to de-stress. 80% rule, I found this very interesting. interesting. Um, basically, um, this is the opposite of Thanksgiving and holiday meals, right? We, we, we eat till we're 80% full. And again, um, this is that 20% gap that we need to realize between hunger, feeling full, and feeling overly full. And so this is the concept of eating like a king in the morning, a prince in the afternoon, and a pauper at night. The worst thing is to have our largest meals at the end of the day when we go to sleep. All those calories tend to convert to storage as opposed to those calories being converted to being used throughout the day. So this concept is very interesting of, of not eating till you're full. Um, so I think this is really interesting to explore. Plant slant, uh, you guys know that uh, by, by looking at the Mediterranean-like diet that many of these diets um, are, are soy, lentils, um, but it varies in, in different environments. Um, you know, sometimes like meat, they gave an example of, they ate a very small portion, three to four ounces, four or five times a month, deck of cards. So again, this is a heavy plant slant. They do eat meat, but the meat is in small um, amounts corresponding to the plants. Wine at five, um, you know, whatever your philosophy is, the point of this is that many of the developing nations uh, do have their own idea of happy hour. It is with um, it is with their community. Um, they're not drinking alone. Uh, they're not drinking uh, to the point of excess, but they drink local wine and they drink it with friends and they drink it with food. And so I said, <laughs> I said, you can't save everything up and have everything on Saturday. So again, consistency, longevity, uh, the idea of, um, you know, happy hour, the idea of downshifting in the afternoon. This is about your socialization, your community, um, belonging. Um, most of these folks had some faith-based community. A denomination doesn't matter, but basically some, you know, they generally will attend something organized uh, for four or so times per month. And they suggest that being involved in something consistently may add four to 14 years of life um, expectancy, this sense of belonging to something greater than what uh, we do every day. Loved one first. Um, you know, a lot of these folks have a long-term partner. Um, you know, we're in complex times. Uh, the point is, whatever your family dynamics are, um, and whatever the complexities of our modern families are, um, we just try to make sure that we commit to that family and support them in whatever uh, scenario we find ourselves in. Great tribe. Um, you know, the concept here is um, be, be cautious about um, the people you hang out with. I shouldn't say cautious. I should say be selective. Um, you know, we want healthy behaviors. We want people that support our healthy behaviors. We don't want people um, who we interact with every day that have unhealthy behaviors that um, we don't want to be engaged in. So, you know, um, we know that folks that surround themselves with people who want to be, have a healthy lifestyle, uh, it rubs off on them. 
So again, um, right tribe, look at your relationships. You know, if some are toxic, some are not working, see if you can work through those. But, um, you know, those uh, increase stress and decrease resiliency for sure. So again, like always, we have just a couple minutes left. Um, I'm gonna give you just one or two slides um, if there are uh, questions um, on motivation and change. You know, um, you guys, I was thinking about this, I may have mentioned before, my dad was at Pratt for years. Um, you are in a highly technical field. And, you know, we have to think about what motivates us and what informs us. So when you're at work, whatever division you're in, and when new critical information comes up or comes across your, de your desk, and it dictates that we must change our processes, what do you do? So a new metal alloy, right? When I was in high school or middle school, you know, my dad's like, hey, here's a piece of XYZ and it's a huge piece and it's light. And he talked to me about medical, metal, metal, metal allergy and medical, metal mixes and tolerances. I mean, this is how I grew up. So when your information changes at work, you have to adapt. Um, it could be about product safety. It could be about customer safety. It could be about the end user safety. So what I want you to think about is, you know, you're presented with data. At work, you have to adapt. It may be a corporate policy. It may be benefit the bottom line. Why, when we are um, given data that should dictate change at home, why are we resistant? Um, what dictates our change at work versus our change at home? You know, so I think with my patients, what motivates us? Is it carrot? Is it stick? Um, what do you need? Do you need data? Do you need labs? Are you following trends? Uh, do you follow advertising versus truth? Cost, hobbies, travel. Do you want better quality of life? Do you want your clothes to fit? What's your passion? Who motivates you? Kids, family, friends, doing things with friends, your mentors, your spouse, partners, loved ones. Um, you know, I, I, probably have not captured everything here, but what I want you to think about is that all this stuff is great, but until we can act upon it, upon it and, and do that incremental change, none of the data really matters. And so I have many conversations with my patients and I'm using the stick and they're like, oh, I don't, I don't wanna eat salmon. I'm like, I don't really care. You're a grown ass adult. You're 60 years old. You're not three. So at some point, we just have to think, <laughs> you know, what is, what is our motivation? What are we, what are we doing? Um, you know, and how do we adopt change? Um, obviously, I would like to use the carrot. I want to educate. I want to motivate. I want to use your labs. I, I don't want you to be stuck in following and chasing trends. We want slow, consistent, incremental improvement in our diet, in our mobility, in all those nine areas of of, of life so that we can have success and be as healthy as we want to be as long as we're here. Um, so that's sort of my, my, my summary. And then I'm not going to go through these other ones. I'll leave this for you. Um, I do a lot with uh, cancer. I'm actually sitting at the Cancer Center in Yvonne today, seeing patients. And I just gave you some of the components of how we educate change uh, from this organization. And I go through the book and and this is all the things that you want to do when you're thinking about cancer prevention. And it overlaps with the Mediterranean diet. And I talk about BMI. What is your BMI? Do you know what it is? I talk about exercise and suggestions that are actionable, fit, frequency, intensity, time, and type, and duration. Um, I talk about high fructose corn syrup and reducing those. All this overlaps with the Mediterranean diet and how you go through that process. I talk about glycemic index, shrinking down those high glycemic, make sure we're emphasizing the low glycemic, removing added sugars as much as possible. Sugars and fruits and vegetables are fine. We want to look at the added sugars and reduce those. Obviously, plant-based Mediterranean diet, you know that's my, my shtick here, so that's a given. Alcohol, as we said, minimize, migrate to wine. I'm not a no, never, not, but um, one to two max, five days a week. Let's talk about liver, fatty liver. You know, there's a whole complexity here. But again, um, if it's one to two max, five days a week, uh, okay. 
I talk to my patients, are you dependent? Do you need a vacation? Can you take a month off? These are things to think about. I'm French and Italian, I love wine. Um, grains, we talked about this. We talked about the DASH diet. Supplements, we'll talk about this, I think in a future lecture. Identify correct deficiencies. Supplements are supplemental. More is not better. Okay, so let's, let's think about that. Um, I have some resources for you here on the, on the last page. Blue zones and cancer prevention and some of the foods and soy, uh, Mayo Clinic on lifestyle, et cetera. Um, you know, I'm in the cancer center and, and the other thing is about access and about, um, you know, how do you make decisions? Um, whether it's Hartford or any other place, um, whether, where are you, wherever you all are in the world and whatever you need access to, there's a movement to have navigators. I'm kind of like the wellness navigator. Um, these folks are the other navigators that will help you navigate through your process of care. So I mention this because um, sometimes when we're trying to make changes and adopt healthy lifestyles and get data, it's very difficult to comprehend how do we get into an area. So in the cancer world, um, navigators are critical. In our system, you can always lean on the navigators to interact with you. Um, and this is a relatively new thing, but very important. Okay, I gave you a, a pyramid that combines Mediterranean plus blue zone plus lifestyle. That's it. Um, so I will hang on. We have about, uh, oh, five minutes till the top of the hour, but I, I'm good for a good 10, 15 minutes. So I'm going to stop and take any critical questions that um, may be combined into some themes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Secor. We got some really great questions throughout the presentation. Um, if your question doesn't get answered today, I'm going to send them all to a PDF to Dr. Secor after to get a little bit more in depth. And he will be coming back for another presentation in April. So you guys will get emails about that as well. Um, a few of the questions that we received, here's a good one. Um, how do we balance eating more fish with watching mercury levels that can be in fish sometimes? So I get that question all the time. Um, exogenous mercury is a, a very important health issue, particularly in pregnancy. And there are studies that suggest that it bioaccumulates and can be passed in breast milk. And so, you know, we're trying to balance um, wild caught fish in areas that are endemic with mercury. So, um, there's controversy about farm raised versus wild caught. Yes, the essential fatty acids are slightly different in the farm raised, but generally the farm raised has no mercury because they're in a contained closed environment. And if the farm raised is using um, high quality plant-based feed uh, in meal, um, you're not going to get that mercury in those fish, but it's a good question. You can decrease your volume. <clears throat> you can use some um, supplementation within your fish, uh, supplements that are tested. We're going to go through that, I think, in a previous, in a future lecture about supplements and supplements like oils that should be tested for additives, preservatives, PCBs, heavy metals. Because these things bioaccumulate in certain areas of the world where we get our fish, think healthy farm raised, think uh, some of the non um, fish from some of those non polluted areas. And if you transition and use supplements intermittently, then have supplements that are tested. Next. Right. What are some recommended sweeteners to replace sugar that you would recommend? I'm sorry, I missed the, uh, did you say substitutes for sweetener? Yes, to replace sugar. So, um, you know, I, I am uh, in all transparency, I'm not a fan of synthetics. Um, so what I first ask people is what's the motivation? Is it a volume thing? Is it a diabetes thing? Is it a hyperglycemia thing? And so first, before I substitute sugar for synthetics, uh, many of my patients have educated me that synthetics give them headaches and migraines and insomnia and digestive components. Um, that being said, stevia, the plant-based stevia, most people like stevia, um, honey, uh, you know, uh, lower glycemic index. So when I look at sugars, I migrate from white refined sugar to raw sugar to honey. If we're thinking glycemic index, white sugar has the highest, brown sugar or raw sugar has much lower, honey has even lower. So first, why are we trying to get rid of that? Second, if it's prediabetes or diabetes, um, remember that also dietary change is important. 
but exercise is as equally as important because certain tissues of the body rely on sugar for fuel, like your muscles. So a lot of my day of diabetics who are type two, not type one, who are plateauing, um, I remind them that strength training and exercise can increase your insulin sensitivity and um, allows your body to utilize its sugar even better. So again, check stevia, get into the honeys, reduce your volume, um, and also fruit sugars, I should, I should mention, whole fruit sugars are also good. Next. Where does coconut oil rank in terms of healthy oils? So this is a really good question. And, um, you know, I, I never had coconut growing up. Um, I don't know if anybody else did. I mean, we had sort of the flakes and the shaved coconut. Coconut is, is um, gaining importance. Um, it does have a little bit of uh, saturated fat. For some people, it will increase triglycerides and cholesterol levels. And so, um, you know, I see people add coconut now to everything. They have raw coconut, they have coconut water, they have coconut milk, they have coconut sweetener. Um, for those of us who didn't grow up in endemic coconut areas, I'm seeing some challenges with coconut. So again, um, you know, being French and Italian, I lean towards the olive oils, I lean towards low temperature sautés. Again, based on what we talked about earlier, I do not lean on high, high heat cooking. If I'm using high heat, it might be a peanut or a sesame that is used in more stir frying that is high heat stable. So, um, you know, it's decent if you're using low level, sort of like avocado oil, but I wouldn't adapt it as a major part of my lifestyle. What are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? Good, bad, if good, how many hours are the best? So um, I am a fan of intermittent fasting. Um, the word fasting is, I don't think it's really great for intermittent fasting. I have a whole handout, I think in our last presentation on intermittent fasting. And so there are three or four commonly identified types. Um, the most common is uh, 16-8. So, um, you know, the complexity of intermittent fasting is that you are still eating a Mediterranean diet, right? So the dietary components do not change. It is still a plant heavy olive oil, high essential fatty acid, clean Mediterranean diet. The difference is you shrink the time at what you eat your food. You don't even really have to change calories. So if somebody's working out and they're fairly active and they're using a 2000 to 2500 calorie diet, they would just eat from, let's say, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. That, I believe, is eight hours. Then, from 6 p.m. to 10 a.m., they would not eat. They may drink tea. They may drink water. They may have some other uh, liquids. But basically, the 16-8 is one of the most commons. Again, you are still eating good quality food. You are not not eating. Um, you are eating those foods from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., and then 6 p.m. on that 16 hours, you are not seeing a lot of food. Uh, there is a seven one where you do that fast uh, once a week, um, every seven days. There is um, uh, 7.30 where you do it seven days once a month. Um, so there's a variety of different types, but I want people to know that it's not an excuse not to eat. It's not an excuse to eat poor poorly nutritious food. Next. Does the Mediterranean diet remove poultry, pork, and red meat completely? No, nope, it doesn't remove it completely. Um, you know, the focus is on um, a variety of, of seafood. And I think it's important to, to reflect back to the mercury question. You know, when I go to Italy or when I, when I travel, you know, we go there, we might eat 30 kinds of seafood. Um, here, you know, we get into seafood ruts where we have one or two. I think the point is to not have red meat be your primary, to not have um, poultry be your primary. Um, it is to rotate. Would I like people to see more fish three times a week? Absolutely. If I had my way, I'd have three fish days. I'd have maybe a veggie day, God forbid. And then maybe we would do one poultry one red meat, uh, one other meat. 
So, you know, think in terms of your proteins and think in terms of your weak, weak. And it's not that you have to eliminate that, but the idea is to reduce it and then rotate other things in um, over time. Time for maybe one more. Do, uh, what are your thoughts on protein shakes? Um, some people add spinach and berries to whey protein powder. Is that something that's okay? So um, I love smoothies um, and, you know, smoothies. So, you know, it depends on what the goal is. So um, I use smoothies in, with a variety of patient populations. Um, I'm in the cancer center here. Many of the folks I'm working with, I'm actually trying to increase weight because they're going through chemotherapy, radiation, and had surgery. So we are trying to stabilize calories, increase them while they're going through their treatment so that we can keep them as healthy as possible. Other people are trying to lose weight and stabilize their eating over time. So I can help people build a smoothie that's 500 calories, 2000 calories. And I do have a smoothie template somewhere that I might uh, share with you. But basically, when I look at a smoothie, exactly what your folks are saying, I think in terms of carbohydrates, protein, healthy fats. So you already know my bias, you're right. My, my smoothie, when I do two or three times a week for myself, uh, one cup of blueberry, blackberry, dark cherry. So I have one cup of fruit in, in the berries specifically. I tend to do a half banana, full banana. Um, I will do a handful of greens if I have them. Um, I will use um, pea protein if you're a vegan or vegetarian. You can get pea protein. Um, I'm not opposed to whey protein. These are mostly isolates, so they are broken down into their amino acid components, so, so they're easy to absorb. So there's usually a protein component, and there's a healthy fat component. The healthy fat component is the thing that people miss because, you know, the important thing is if you're juicing, you can spike your blood sugar, spike your insulin. If you're using smoothies and you don't put that healthy fat component in, you can still spike your blood sugar, although not as much because you're putting in whole foods. So I might add a half an avocado, or I might add a couple tablespoons of flax oil, or I might add um, half a cup of yogurt, um, et cetera. So I'm a fan. Um, I, I just have to think about why a person's using it. Um, if they're a bad, consistent eater, and if they're on the run, or my construction workers who are on the road all the time, or my policemen or firemen, you know, I'll say, great, you know, make one, have it in your cooler. And at least I know you're getting a healthy meal that you can travel with. And then we, we you know, we gauge it. Is it going to be a 500 calorie or a thousand calorie? Are you using that for breakfast and lunch? Or are you using it for healthy snacks? So I'm a fan. I just uh, need to drill down and look at some of the reasons and expectations and tweak it a bit. I got time for a couple more if you guys do. All right. What about, what about pizza? How could you make a healthy pizza? <laughs> <laughs> I love this question. Um, you can ask the participants if uh, they've traveled to Italy and they've actually understand what a real pizza is. And so you know, when we look at the TV and we look at the advertisements and we look at the layers of five layers of cheese and stuffed crust, and that is not like traditional pizza, right? That is like an American made, uh, you know, high fat, uh, uh, gastroesophageal reflux waiting uh, to happen concoction. So to your point, you know, pizzas generally, and you know, um, a, a palatano is very light. It has fresh basil and fresh herbs. It might have fresh tomatoes. It might have a little bit of fresh mozz or cheese, but, but pizzas are very, very light. Um, so, you know, we do gluten-free pizzas. We make our own crust sometimes. So, um, you know, when I was in med school, we would have um, pizza parties where, you know, we'd have four couples and they'd each bring something. I mean, we had white bean pizzas, we had the sauteed onions and mushrooms and oyster pizzas. You know, again, I look at a pizza, and what I see on TV is not the pizzas that I like. Um, so when you're thinking about a pizza, you know, um, sauteed vegetables and good mushrooms, and um, you could even get plant-based plant -based pepperoni, and it tastes just like pepperoni, except it's plant-based. So again, Pizzas, what you see on TV are, are, are to, I think, your point, 
not the healthiest. Um, you know, play around, make your, make your own pizza or buy some gluten-free shells or, or make your own. And then think about a variety of healthy toppings. You know, we make our own pesto, right? Simple, um, you know, basil, olive oil, whether you like garlics or shallots, some pecorino and brown cheese, you can do a basil pizza. We do sauteed onions and smoked, mus smoked mussels. I think that's a great pizza. You can do a veggie pizza where you lightly saute your veggies in olive oil, a little salt and pepper and spread them around. So I think you can make it healthy. You're hard pressed to go out to the, to the, 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 you know, the fast shops and get a healthy one. But, you know, if you're buying it out, Hey, lean towards veggie, get their, get their veggie King pizza. Um, you know, that, that's a way you can do it. Lighten up on the cheese. Don't get the 10 cheese pizza stuffed crust pizza. I call that the high cholesterol pizza. Um, so anyway, another question or two? I'm getting hungry. I don't know about you guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bite my apple. Go ahead. <laughs> so when it comes from sweet wine versus dry wine or red versus white, is there a preference? Is there a more beneficial than the other? I'm chewing. I'm sorry. <laughs> So the theme with wine, you know, based on our polyphenols, right, we know that red grapes and grape skin has the highest content of polyphenols and antioxidants. So in general, um, red wine seems to be in general healthier, um, but there's a lot of mixed varieties now. Um, you know, um, generally, um, if there's, if they're, you know, again, is it just general consumption or is someone diabetic, right? If someone, again, not type one, if they're type two and they have a little sugar issue, right? We know that red wine has a lower glycemic index than a Gewurztraminer sweet white. So a lot of that is preference. Um, I tend to le lean towards full body uh, reds. My birthday is next month, if anybody cares. So, you know, I like, uh, I like uh, cab salves. I like full bodied um, reds. Um, I personally am not a big fan of whites, although, you know, I did have, uh, I made a scampi Sunday and I used uh, a Josh white, um, I, I forget what it was, but I used that as the base of the scampi. Um, you know, I made a, a, a shrimp scallop uh, capers sauteed onions scampi and it was great with some mushrooms and, um, and some broccoli. So I think it's personal preference, but if you're thinking health, you know, if you can get into some of the reds, that's going to give you some more of those antioxidants versus the whites. All right, I'll leave you with one more, which is, do you have any good recommendations for books to read about the Mediterranean diet? There is so many books um, out there on the Mediterranean diet. Um, it is overwhelming. I probably at my house have five or six cookbooks on the Mediterranean diet. Um, I think the, I think, you know, the reason I introduced the blue zones in that aspect is because, um, you know, that came from like a National Geographic scientific assessment. So again, you know, the blue zones are like the Mediterranean diet plus longevity or anti-aging. So I think if you sneak in kind of the back door to the blue zones, and also I think I gave you um, some references on... Um, uh, the Mayo Clinic. Uh, so, so, you know, I really like the Mayo Clinic. They have a big uh, integrated medicine and lifestyle medicine. I gave you lifestyle medicine. I gave you plant-based foods. Uh, Lifestylemedicine.org is doing a lot of things. That's one of the certifications I'm leaning on at Hartford to sort of develop my uh, personalized and lifestyle medicine uh, place. So there are several. Um, you know, it's hard for me to just pick out one you can lean on some of the references that I've already given you, uh, going to the Blue Zone, which is reputable. Um, a lot of Dean Ornish's stuff. I like Dean Ornish. He's part of the Lifestyle Medicine Group. So hopefully some of these references already uh, will support you. But, you know, what's the goal? You know, they have them for breakfast. They have lunch dishes. They have Mediterranean diet for appetizers, you know. So there's a lot of variety of um, high quality stuff out there. Um, so depending on your motivation, um, you know, look at some of these resources and then select one that's of interest to you. I read a lot of medical papers. <laughs> so I, I read, I read the research on it as opposed to reading leisure books on the Mediterranean diet. So 
Is that it? Is there one more? Or are we all set? We got another one. One more. How about delivered meals? Say that again. Using um, a delivery for meals so that you take the guesswork out for the first month. So that's you know that's a really important um, a really important thing, particularly the last two years with COVID, and. Um, I've looked at, you know, Blue Chef, I think it's Blue Chef. Um, I've looked at healing meals. Um, so what I remind folks is that no matter where you live, again, I'm in the Farmington Valley, right? Um, you know, we're kind of spoiled. We have Big Y, we have Whole Foods now, we have um, um, Fresh Market. So I just want you to appreciate that many of these places now you can actually go like Big Y has a nutritionist and I send patients there and I say, you know, you know, you can talk to them and say, hey, you know, I really want to get into this Mediterranean area. Can you help me do that? You know, wh whatever your philosophy about Amazon is, the beautiful thing about that, like the one that they just opened in Avon, I can go on my app. It saves my selections. Um, I can pre-order and they shop for me and put it together. So, you know, a lot of the online apps um, I've been playing around with it doesn't necessarily work for my personal lifestyle because um, literally the clinic I'm in now is one mile from the brand new Whole Foods. So when I look at our traveling um, back and forth, you know, we usually go to Stu Leonard's, we go to Trader Joe's, we go to Whole Foods. And so we think about, you know, what's our week? And then we think about um, leaning on some of the stores and I'm, I may do that first, you know, wherever you shop, um, lean on those stores and say, you know, I really need support in migrating into this Mediterranean diet area. And believe it or not, many of them have resources to help you. They want to help you. They want you to shop there. Um, but there are several online that I like. I'll try to dig up, dig up those uh, and email them to you or talk about them in the next lecture. Awesome. We have one more question, one which more. is how you can maintain a healthy diet if you've been told to follow a low fiber diet due to Crohn's was so, well you know, it. Yeah. So, you know, I have lots of patients with gastroparesis, with Crohn's, with irritable bowel, with ulcerative colitis. And so obviously, you know, as I, as I think I said a couple of times, you always have to look at your health concerns and look at the severity of your concerns and, and layer the suggestions on top of that. Now, what I will say is, you know, with my folks with Crohn's who are stable, um, and you know, Crohn's is you know an autoimmune inflammatory um, issue. Many people have issues in the distal part of their small intestine. That is troubling because that's the area where they reabsorb many of their nutrients. And so, I I always want to be very clear with the team that's managing them, uh, the gastroenterologist and or the rheumatologist. And, you know, I want to have a discussion to say, is it truly no fiber? Is it low um, insoluble fiber? Like, obviously, you wouldn't chew on a broccoli stalk. However, um, you're saying that oatmeal's out. So I think, you know, I understand when people are in flares, uh, we pull back insoluble fibers, um, yeah, insoluble fibers, roughage, if you will. Um, but when there's long periods of remission, you know, my understanding is that we can gently increase these soluble fibers. And so I tend to lean towards the soluble, more gentle at lower doses. Um, but again, when someone's flaring, um, we usually do a very clean diet, and then they have to migrate back up through liquid and through, um, through those different um, fibers and proteins that bother them. So, you know, I, I would lean on those. My, my experience is that there's a lot of blanket suggestions that don't tend to fit everybody. And so when we look in the fiber bucket, if you will, uh, there's a huge continuum. You know, um, many people with ulcerative colitis Crohn's, they can do hummus. Well, hummus is high fiber, high protein chickpeas. Um, the other thing I do want to mention is that um, there's a whole move towards these hot pots and pressure cooking. Um, and there's a couple of docs out there in the country who are looking at this whole concept of fiber and lectins and inflammation. 
And so many of my patients say we take beans, which they have problems with. If they put them in the pressure cooker for 15 minutes, um, they can tolerate the beans. So the other thing that I, I really would look out for is different ways we prepare. Uh, raw is different than steamed, which is different than um, that pressure cooking in the hot pot. So um, I, I don't know, that probably didn't help, but again, it is individual, I understand that. And I am wary of someone that says no fiber or low fiber. And again, I'd have to really think about uh, inflammatory frequency, remission, and then also, um, you know, can we lean on that soluble fiber? And can we think about those, um, you know, op opportunities to, to cook uh, slightly differently? Um, I hope that helps at least guide you a little bit. Watch for that. Um, we did have one last question, which is about the impossible meats. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Opinions on that. Um, so, you know, um, they're obviously new, um, you know, from an environmental and um, impact and from a, a plant-based health impact. Um, I, I think they're very, very interesting. Um, I've had them and I think they're fine. Um, you know, you have to drill down into some of these recipes to make sure that, you know, th that you don't have any other issues. Many of them do contain soy um, or uh, TVP or textured vegetable protein. So, you know, if, if you don't have an issue with the component, like I said, we, we've tried some of the um, vegetarian vegan pizzas and they were really good. You know, they were, they were gluten-free, they had uh, impossible meat or they had um, the variation of that, the plant-based pepperoni. Um, I will tell you that I couldn't, they were very, very good. So um, I wouldn't, I, I do have a caveat. I would not transition my entire diet within a week to that. Again, if you think about your gut and your microbiome and your, your current state of health, um, whenever you do dietary changes, just think that the whole digestive system generally has to adapt uh, to that. So, you know, introduce those things slowly, uh, see how you feel about them, introduce um, them in a variety of different ways um, and, and over time and, and see how you react. Some people love them and they, and they really are doing a good job. I see a couple of uh, post-cardiac rehab after bypasses and, you know, they're migrating into that space and they're doing quite well. Um, and um, they're not feeling neglected or that they're missing out. All right. Um, I did see that someone had asked a question about eggs. Um, I think it got buried. So if someone wants to type it in there. Eggs. Um, yeah, eggs. Opinions on. So um, um, I'm looking at taking on some nutritional fellows and I've been doing some 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 pretty vast reviews of some nutritional literature lately, and um, I came across a couple of um, a couple of 10, 20, 30 papers on eggs. And you know, you know, it used to be that you were worried about eggs because of cholesterol, and I think that's maybe what you're alluding to. And um, I just want to, to to have a couple of comments. One, um, I, I think we're coming to the realization that the preparation of the egg has a lot to do with how the egg reacts. So for example, if you are frying your egg in butter over high heat, you are oxidizing the oils, oxidizing the fat, that is bad. If you are poaching, soft boiling, soft scrambling, it does not seem to be bad and it also does not seem to raise total cholesterol. So, you know, when I look at the literature over time, my sense is that um, preparation has a lot to do with it and high heat oxidizing of the oils you're using is a no-no. So um, one to two, three times a week, um, if you're leaning towards poaching, one minute, two minute, three minute, uh, soft scrambled, uh, even omelets that are not burnt are highly oxidized. And that's a theme with all of your oils. Um, a lot of the stuff we overcook changes the form of the proteins and the fats that we see, and we can't process those. So that's that's a lot of the movement in the literature that I see, in my opinion. Um, and again, uh, the proof is you work with your doctor, you take your sugar, you take your cholesterol levels, 
you adjust your diet for three to six months. You do one to two eggs in those, in those um, ways of preparation, poached or soft boiled, um, um, soft, hard boiled, I think it is. Um, and then reevaluate your cholesterol and your fatty acids three to four months. That is the proof. And a lot of the testing really um, should help us in our nutritional and lifestyle changes. And we should engage our doctors, our, um, our uh, employers on proper use of our laboratories in conjunction with lifestyle and dietary change. Um, I try to do the assessment and then say, hey, let's try this for a couple of quarters if we're really concerned, and then let's reassess. That will give us the data which may suggest uh, it's not a problem for you or it is a problem. I hope that answers that. Thank you so much. We have gotten so many amazing questions. I'm so sorry we can't answer them all, everyone. I'm gonna be collecting most of these questions and writing them down. This presentation was also recorded, so you'll be able to watch it back. We'll also have copies of the slides and any other wonderful information that Dr. Secor will give us. And you guys will receive that along with a post presentation survey, which also has a spot for questions on it. So please go ahead and go take that. Um, I will send that out shortly. And thank you guys so much for jumping on. A huge thank you to Dr. Secor. Absolutely love having you present for us and hopefully you'll join us again in April for our next one. Thank you for the opportunity. Be safe this weekend and take care. Thank you. Bye, everyone.